Hello, and welcome to this wide right edition of the Purple Journal podcast. <laughs> wide, way wide right. <clears throat> I am your host, uh, Joe Johnson, owner of PurplePTSD.com and VikingsTerritory.com. I am also the co-host of the Morning Joe's show, which is a new show we launched last week. And by we, I mean the other Joe, hence the name Morning Joe's. That Joe is Joe Orberly, hey. who is uh, battling through, at his age, could be uh, a lethal cold. Ooh, that was a low blow. Jesus. Uh, I'll, I'll power through it, Joe. Don't worry. I'll thank you. Gro- growl a little bit and uh, be a little more Fear soothing. Donovan McNabb Super Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> Just puking uh, in between takes. That's a real pro. A pro's pro. Uh, Joe writes for PurplePTSD.com, VikingsTerritory.com, and the Sports Post. And uh, Luke Braun is here. Uh, he returned alive from Green Bay. Scarred, but alive. Yeah, emotionally got, scarred. Uh, you know, got some bumps and bruises, but we made it. And I'm sure some of your arteries are a little worse for their wear. Maybe a liver there, but you'll make <laughs> it. Uh, I, I still have meat sweats. <laughs> uh, the Midwest. Uh, Luke, <laughs> Luke writes for Purple PTSD, Vikings Territory, and he also uh, co-hosts the Pocket Protectors podcast. Uh, yeah. <coughs> <coughs> we're all a little under the weather back. here. We're, Brought we're, to, we're like, uh, all just still shook. It was a... Like, it was okay, I guess. <laughs> it, it is such, for me, that type of game, it's so weird because you don't know where to put your feelings... You know, like being, seeing the comeback and having a comeback like that be so different from what we're used to from the Vikings just as a case study. <clears throat> and then seeing that, ru- so you're excited and then it, it feels bad because they didn't win it. So it's hard for me as an emotional person and an emotional football fan to kind of rectify my feelings on that. Um but, and we'll get into this in depth, because I first want to hear about your trip to Lambeau, Luke, but I think there's some silver linings that came out of that game that we can all be a little, rest a little easier about. But first, um, you got to go to Lambeau, which I assume was, the, yeah. was for the first time? Yes, yeah, I'd never been to Lambeau or even Green Bay before, um, which is amazing. Uh, I went with my dad, and he hadn't been there since, like, I think Randy Moss's rookie year was the last time he was there. So he and they and they'd done the renovation and everything. So it was, you know, cool experience for the both of us. Uh, and we have some family in Wisconsin, so we were able to, uh, you know, see family that we don't get to see all the time. That's great. Or at least I don't you get to see all the time. You came away with a tie, Luke. How just, I mean, come on, dude. You traveled <laughs> to L.A. and it, you hey, a tie? Since USA yeah. Stadium opened, games that I have attended, we are 3-0-1. That's pretty good. I don't, I don't even want you going near the L.A. Coliseum or wherever the Rams play the Vikings for crying out loud. I have only been to one Rams game, and I caused them to lose it. So I think we might be okay here. <laughs> All right. One one meaningful Rams game. I I'm going to hold you to that. Preseason, to a preseason game this year just for fun. Because um, the tickets were like 28 bucks. <laughs> but, yeah, it was a really cool experience. Um, I... I am distantly related to a very, very diehard Packers fan uh, who is obscenely wealthy and owns a uh, a house right next to Lambeau Field, like literally uh, out my the window of the bedroom that I stayed in. Lambeau Field's lights like shine into the window. Wow! And uh, it is decked out in all kinds of Packers memorabilia. The lion's share of which was purchased from Brett Favre's restaurant that he had in Green Bay while he was there. And then when he left Green Bay, the restaurant closed, and he sold off all the memorabilia. Uh, And this guy bought everything, every single ounce of it. Uh, And now it's all hanging up over the walls. They have a living room that is uh, modeled to be an exact replica of Vince Lombardi's office. Um, they have like signed helmets and all kinds of signed jerseys and stuff. They have a bar downstairs. Luke, do they have any uh, uh, partially burned number four jerseys? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, we were there. We almost burned a Ponder jersey. Though. Uh, we were we were there with um, Max from WCCO, the sports reporter. He he was doing a piece on that house for CCO, really? going 
uh, going into the game, and he was actually there, and they, as a joke, almost burned a Ponder jersey because you know at least everybody in that in that room could hate me. the Ponder jersey. <laughs> but it was it was a really cool experience, and they were all very generous. Um, you know, there was a heckle here and there, but I, I definitely uh, you can feel the kind of brotherly love between Vikings fans and Packers fans, even though it's a rivalry. It's it's still very much like we're all Midwesterners and we're all family. Um, and the tailgate party that they have before every game is insane. They get up at, uh, these two guys come in and get up at 6.30 a.m., arrive at 6.30 a.m. and start cooking um, these, like, bratwursts and baked beans and the greatest pork belly tips I've ever had in my life. They have custom home-brewed beers, uh, and they make, like, special meats for each game. So, like, the Sunday night football game against the Bears, they actually ate bear meat. Uh, uh-huh. before that game and like like had it in the slow cooker and like they have all these beautiful smoked meats and it was just this like heavenly tailgate and then we went off and uh, watched the game at Lambeau Field we were right in the corner where Diggs caught that two point conversion which we did not see because we uh, left early thinking the game was over after the Treadwell tipped interception but I don't think I can do that this podcast with, I don't think I can do this podcast with you anymore after hearing that I don't bit. think I can do it with me anymore either <laughs> At least you weren't, like, in a cab on your way to the airport, like, following the play-by-play on your phone or something. At least you got yeah, to yeah. see it. Um, we, so we left. We we walked out, and we, you know, the game was, like, very much looking over. There was The Packers had the ball, like, in the red zone with, like, you know, two minutes and 13 seconds to go or something like that. And so we're, you know, walking down in our Viking gear. <clears throat> And all the Packers fans are, like, as whooped up as they could possibly be. They're, like, scolding in our face. They're going, like, yeah, get out of here, get out of here. Like, heckling us as we leave. Um, and we were, like, all right, well, whatever, one and one. You know, bounce back game next week, and this is going to be fun. And then we uh, we get back to, to the house to grab our stuff, and we see that they're still watching on the TV, and the Vikings have the ball again somehow. And this was, like, a five-minute real-time walk out of the stadium since nobody was leaving yet, so we could, you know, zip right out. Um, and then... They're, and they're reviewing the controversial Clay Matthews, Clay Matthews penalty and mm-hmm. the interception and stuff, and that the interception that got called back and stuff. And we're like, how did we get the ball back? And all of these things happened very fast. <laughs> and we watched the rest of the game on TV with these like bleeding Packers fans. You know, I was going to ask you if you wore Viking stuff, and you did, which is oh, badass. Yeah. But I've heard that it's yeah. not like people don't give you that hard of a time, like Philly no. style. No, it's it's a lot of like friendly heckling. You know, I had somebody going like. Oh, where's your star tight end? And I just looked back and I was like, oh, he's not that great. Yeah. <laughs> Let me show you exactly how your heckle is wrong. I'm that's yeah, plus, he's the second plus. best tight end on the team. What are you talking about? <laughs> um, well, that's amazing. I mean, at least it turned out at least as a good story. You'll probably remember it a lot more than if it was just a regular game. But what a yeah, the experience was awesome. Yeah, I gotta you'd get out there. You'd remember it better if you'd watched the rest of the game live. <laughs> just see. <laughs> Ah, uh, that's so cool. I'm sorry, I know some people that left the uh, Tommy Kramer to Ahmad Rashad Cleveland victory way back when. They left that. And the original so- Minneapolis Miracle, or the Miracle at the Met, maybe. That's what it was called. Yeah. I was at, I was on a plane with a bunch of people that left the Minneapolis Miracle early, and we didn't, and I still made the flight just barely, and people were like, oh, we could have made it! Yeah. I read a few of those stories in, like, City Pages and stuff, like a... A daughter and father and daughter paid all this money for the the Saints game and had to watch it from home in Northeast Minneapolis. But you know the the, the silver lining isn't just that they tied. Um, you know it makes the division stuff a lot easier. They just have to you know beat Green Bay at home and, and take care of things with Detroit and Chicago. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, there seems like it's just been a bloodbath this weekend. We'll, we'll talk about the game a little bit more um, in a little bit, but. The, the the biggest topic obviously being the Daniel Carlson for Dan Bailey switch. Um, you know, I after two weeks to, to make that move, granted they, they said in the you know the preseason NFL kickers don't miss two kicks in a row or two kicks in a game, uh, to miss three uh, a thirty five yarder with the history that this team has. It's not a super surprising move, and, and we've talked about it on the show a lot this this offseason, why bring in a rookie kicker. Um, but I wanted to kick it over to Joe and, and just kind of get your initial feelings on that, uh, on the move itself, uh, wh- whether you thought it was, you know, too early or if it was 
if if they made this move this early, why did they even make draft a kicker in the first place? Why didn't they go uh, stick with four bath? Um, or just general thoughts on on the move. It it was uh, a move that had to be done, I believe. Um, you know, when the, when the kid comes out in his post game press conference and says his lack of confidence, that's that's like your okay, check that box, he's gone. I mean, they they were already thinking about it, like you said couple weeks ago, uh, NFL kickers don't miss two in a row. I wonder what you call someone who misses three in a row. You, you call him a former, Yeah, a former NFL kicker. Uh, Insurance salesman. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I, I, uh, I feel really bad. I'm a good kid, but you know, uh, it, it, as much as you can <clears throat> applaud the move for, which is what everybody and their brother was calling for, you also have to look back a little further and say, well, you know, you you drafted this guy, you kept him on the team over the veteran in a season when you're, you know, got have Super Bowl operations. So some of that is on you. And I guess I, I had a little bit of a comp- uh, problem with uh, Zimmer's callousness in this uh, Monday press conference. You know, I, yeah, yeah, that's right. It's a business. People's jobs are on the line. You guys are, you know, hoping to do well this year. And, but, you know, it's still a human being and gets whacked, and you, now you publicly kicked him in the teeth on the way out the door. So um, that might be a little strong. But, uh, you know, well, I, I think it I, might be. It's not super strong just because for them to make that move, it implies that they weren't fully invested in him in the first place, and that raises other questions. You know what I mean? So it's he can't really just blame it all on the kicker. You should look at Prefer himself, Spielman, and say, well, why did we even do this? And maybe not be... So yeah, you wonder what, Kurt about you wonder what dictates it. I mean, when they sit down there and talk about it, you know, first of all, I, I mean, Joe and I, you talked about this on Monday morning. I mean, <clears throat> they used to have uh, Ryan Longwell and, and Chris Cluey, and and since then, uh, Prefer has been out scouting up other kickers and and punters, and and they've been bringing them in, maybe you know, a uh, hell or hair early just to, to get those guys up and up to speed for going forward because they knew these older guys were going to be done soon, but. Um, I remember uh, Ryan Longwell wasn't too happy about leaving. I don't think Chris Clue was either. They probably felt they had some football yet. But regardless, I mean, uh, some of that is on pre for you know, because they've been trying to fill those spots ever since, and and uh, they haven't done it. I, I, I'm glad they, they, they cut bait here because I don't know that after seeing what we saw with uh, uh, the Vikings go through Blair Walsh and trying to, to massage his ego and keep get him back – up there. I don't think that was going to happen with this kid because he didn't have the, the rookie season that uh, Walsh did to have any kind of basis for it. And, you know, you're you're. Uh, so I, I I think that's also played into a two for Zimmer because he yeah from that point on he's had a lot of he's had a short leash with 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 the uh, the kicking game. So you know I like I said I you know I, as as tough as it was and how all the players afterwards said all the right things to the media, you know, we're sticking with this guy, he's our teammate, blah, blah, blah. You know darn well when they were dragging their tails off that field after slugging it out for for how, for three hours like that, that they weren't just a little bit, you know, upset that, damn, we lost that game. So, you know, it's part of it. It's it's strange that kicking can have so much to do with the, the wins and losses, but that's the nature of the beast. Yeah, I mean, he cost you nine points. That, that nine points... He makes one of those, and it's a win. He makes two of those, and it's, like, maybe doesn't even go to overtime, right? Yeah. Um, or, I mean, theoretically, because two of them went yep. over time. But, You're like, right. a lot of the situations that happen in the game become, like, unnecessary and way less of a huge deal if Carlson can make a dang kick. Um, I will say Zimmer's right about one thing, is that a fifth-round pick is really water off a duck's back. It is not that valuable of an asset. Uh, but I also don't believe that he thinks that because if he really did think that, they would have gone about the preseason kicking competition a lot differently. They wouldn't have cut Kai Forbath after his first miss of the preseason, uh, and they, they as in a less of a foregone conclusion. You mean right? They wouldn't have treated that as it's Carlson's job, and you know it's going to take a miracle for Forbath to win it. They would have treated that as a more fifty-fifty competition, and if they had done so. <laughs> Kind of feels like Kai Forbath would have won because Carlson would have had that crater game in the third one. Kai Forbath would have just had to make some in the rain. So that that feels like kind of oh now it's really convenient that you think fifth round picks don't matter when you were so so concerned with cutting your fifth round kicker that you were like very unwilling to do it when it was clear that he was not you know that he was he was showing like concerning signs in the preseason and you weren't going to keep the veteran over the the unstable rookie 
So <laughs> it's uh, they ended up with the right choice, though. It's and, interesting yeah. to see that how how he misses. You know, a 48 yarder and a 49 yarder are not long for his this guy's leg, and certainly a 35 yarder is, especially when he makes yeah. three extra points at 33 yards. I mean, it's obviously a mental thing. Yeah. Back to the whole, whole right golf and all coach. right. Yeah. I, and, I'd be really and, curious. There's some really interesting uh, kicker breakdown people on Twitter, and I'm very curious to see if they have any thoughts on why uh, Dan Carlson missed it. I remember there's somebody from uh, inside the pylon. I can't remember his name, but he did a great job flip breaking down the Blair Walsh miss uh, of infamy, and I wonder if he has any thoughts. Yeah, and I, I look. Uh, I was listening to K Fan. I think on Monday. I think it was the Common Man show, and he had a few theories as to the the move in picking up Carlson in the fifth round in the first place and he had uh, there's two schools of thought that they were using and I wanted to kick that question to you Luke um that either the team was overthinking the position or that they were arrogant in their special teams and that includes uh at the punter position and maybe saying like okay well Forbath was good and he can make the kicks that this team <laughs> needs you know 40 you know uh, high 30s to mid 40s um, he might miss an extra point here or there, which he did, um, and, and maybe the arrogance comes from saying we can get that kind of field goal kicking, but if, if we bring someone else in, then we'll also get extra points, or um, if they're just overthinking it and trying to be too perfect. Uh, I don't really know what conclusion he and his producer came to, but I thought it was an interesting line of reasoning just to wonder exactly what they've been doing really since Longwell and... Uh, Cluey. And Cluey, who I, I think we had him on the show last year, and he said he could still kick. I mean, he's not <laughs> – after his career. He would never come back to the NFL. Yeah, I don't – He won't well, go near it again. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think the the mistake the Vikings made is the same mistake that every team that ever drafts a kicker makes, and it is assuming that you can uh, accurately scout kickers. So I did a little analogy on Twitter that I think makes a lot of sense today. Um <laughs> Imagine that you had to scout the entire PGA, and you had to predict who was going to win the FedEx Cup. But you only got the first two golf rounds of the first tournament, and you get to talk to each golfer for 15 minutes. Do you think you would be good at that? Do you think you would get them right? Of course not. That is like, there's so much more golf to be played, right? But about two rounds worth of golf swings is about how many kicks a a college kicker will, will have in their whole career that you get to scout them on. And that's just not enough data points to make a good impression and it's it's a, a facet of the fact that kickers just don't kick a lot in games they're only on for like what six plays in a game so you don't get a lot of looks at them and you don't and for a, for a position that is so important mentally like your mental disposition is so important just like golf you don't actually get a chance to like talk to these guys and figure out how mentally tough they are and whether that's a psych test or like some interview questions, I don't even know how you would do that if you had time, but then add the fact that you get literally like 25 minutes at the combine to talk to these kids. And then maybe another like hour, if you decide to bring them in for a top 30 visit at great cost to the other positions. So it's, it's just impossible to scout kickers. The league is historically very bad at scouting kickers. I mean, just right now, like the last three or four drafted kickers of all created Zane Gonzalez, Daniel Carlson, you know, the the Roberto Aguayo disaster. Um, it just isn't a very good system right now. It is very much a lot of guesswork, and you shouldn't spend draft picks on guesswork, and that's the same mistake that everybody makes. And it's a, a mistake, yeah, I think built in arrogance of, yeah, we can definitely tell that this is a good kicker, we can be confident in that, and we can coach kickers. And, like, all of those things are, like, impossible. <clears throat> And that must be why with, like, the the connective tissue between Blair Walsh and Carlson is that they were uh, big leg guys. And so they must think if they have the physicality, we can maybe fix any problems between the ears. I know Carlson had, like, a up-and-down senior season. Um, but it's clearly uh, a lot more difficult than that. And I thought it was – somebody called into uh, Common Man and said that this all goes back to – uh, for the fifth men- mention of the show, Cluey, because since Prefer has had to undergo sensitivity training, he's been too nice to his kickers, and they, they've taken advantage by blowing oh, up. Which that that telling him that NFL kickers don't miss two in a row is being very nice, so I'm not really cluing into that. Yeah, but, you know, it's, it's a, not a high logic. Uh, I mean, take, take a look at take a look at uh, and just this week, you know, 
You still got Sebastian Janikowski kicking field goals. Why? Because he can. And he, and he, he, he doesn't apparently feel the pressure, you know, or maybe he hasn't had to feel it all those years not making the playoffs in Oakland, maybe. I don't know. But uh, And now who did the Vikings sign? They signed Dan Bailey, someone with a proven track record, who's who's grown up and, and you know, has has done it. You don't know with a new guy if they're going to do it. You know, I, part of me almost wanted to see them put uh, – Carlson on the practice squad, and that uh, might happen actually. It, it could. They have an opening, they, but it, yeah, they I, just I, terminated part, Jack Tocho. Yeah, I, I, part of me would almost. I was saying that earlier. Put him on the practice squad. Give him some seasoning. He's got the leg. Let him build up some uh, some calluses on his on his brain so that he can you know uh, get into the league and start learning what it takes and 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 find out yourself if you've got it. I mean, you know, I one of them is. With a, a leg is done, you know, Blair Walsh will probably never work in the league again. So I, I, I'm hoping that maybe that's what happens, but who knows? Because you know Bailey's going to be good. I suspect. Hope we don't know how long forever. He had a bad season last year, but then I saw something online where put on by someone saying all these people that had great seasons after they had their one bad season. So we'll see how that. Yeah, goes. I can actually expound on that. So that the the major <coughs> anecdotal example is Robbie Gould. Uh, he was in Chicago for a long time, was a good kicker there, and then had like one kind of bad year, got released. And then San Francisco has picked him up, and he's been excellent ever since. He's made 28 um, field goals in a row. <laughs> yeah, and... Uh, breaking so, records down there. So there's that, and then that's like, okay, but that's only one example. But then uh, Kevin Cole, uh, Cole underscore Kev on Twitter, he's very... Um, he's, he's a very good analytics follow, if you're interested in that. Um... And he basically chimed in and said, yeah, this is actually the norm. You know, kickers with good careers who then will, like, kind of fall away for one year because everybody's prone to that. And then the team, you know, reacts to that and kicks them, and, uh, kicks them off the team. Um, whoever picks them up next is, like, has a better chance to get a good kicker. So this is actually probably the best possible way to get a kicker, even though, you know, everything is a little bit of guesswork because kicking is such a strange and nebulous thing um this is probably the best route is to take a guy who you know maybe had one bad year because he was hurt and then got cut because of someone because someone cheaper was on the team and i like what i hear from bailey and that the fact that he wants to uh he was he got a lot of offers and he was shopping around to find someone that he can win with that means i want to be there when they win but i also want to be there helping them win i'm not yeah. going to sh- away from a from a pressure opportunity he knows what's coming if you plan a good team that doesn't mean they're gonna kill everybody. That means that's a good that point. You're, you're gonna have to uh, you're gonna have to you know kick a uh, game winning field goal here or there, especially as it gets down to the wire. So I, you know, like, he, I like hearing that after what the, this team has been through. He could have gone to Cleveland and you know nope. had some low risk kicks or some low pressure kicks. Right. Um, and I know we Joe, you and I talked about this. Uh, we were a little <laughs> concerned. You brought this up on Morning Joe's that. The Vikings, from a salary cap standpoint, maybe couldn't offer them as much as another team um, did because I think uh, at the time we had like two point seven million dollars left. Right. And so, not until the guys have been signing since then. Yeah, yeah. I know it's uh, uh, it's been a whirlwind, but uh, it, it just means he, that he, he wanted to be here. He bypassed cool. Joe. He, he bypassed the uh, Rams as well, who lost Greg Zerline uh, this weekend and cost me a I'll say for the third time a fantasy football win. Damn it. So. Yeah, it's so. it's you know the reason I was kind of saying it was there's some silver lining stuff is just that I've I do feel like and I brought this up last week that I I don't like when people take away the only thing that I get consistently from Vikings games and that's my pity party and so when people <laughs> tell me oh don't worry about you know uh, Carlson he won't blow the season and uh, you know to me. The Vi- the more the Vikings give them give themselves an opportunity for something heartbreaking to happen, the higher the probability is going to be that that very thing is going to happen. So you know to come out of Green Bay with a tie uh, and still you know be in full control of their own destiny in the division and have a, 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 a on paper upgrade at kicker uh, for when the playoffs rolls around, I think is all win win. You know I I couldn't be happier about that. Situation. Sure. I went in. I can tell you with extreme in, uh, confidence that Daniel Carlson will not blow this season. Uh, At least not for us. Yes, I was in Hudson, Wisconsin last night, Joe, and I was uh, talking to the bartender there, and 
and we we started talking about the game, and he was uh, said that you know they're kind of bummed because they lost, they tied the game on their home field, and so now they got to come to uh, U.S. Bank Stadium and win it to to get the uh, uh, the hand back in in uh, the the season rivalry, the tiebreaker, and potentially the division. It's going to be a lot tougher for them. So they they really feel like they lost a lot more than the Vikings did in this tie. And I think as if the Vikings keep winning, this tie is going to grow in, in value as the season goes on. So I think it'll be good. Especially with, I think Aaron yeah. Rodgers came out today and said he was a little worried about his knee getting worse before it gets better. So there's that too. Oof. But what were you going to say, Luke? Uh, I, I was just agreeing. Yeah, oh. it's it's nice. It's it's nice because there was definitely a lot of points in this game. Like I don't think the Vikings played well enough to win. I think the Packers played better than the Vikings on the, on the whole. And to escape with a half of a win at least, it, yeah, I think we should feel like we stole one. Yep, I agree. And I think um, it'll, look, it'll look better as they go on. And, and and you know, like I said earlier, they both should have lost it. And the Vikings definitely should have lost it when when Clay Matthews tackled the. Cousins and he threw that interception. That that's not a penalty. I don't care what anybody says. But yeah, that Tony Carrenti, uh, the ref, expounded on that and said that's not any of the new rules. It's not the Aaron Rodgers rule. A lot of people are like taking a victory lap about like, aha, Aaron Rodgers is on rule. Uh, yeah, that's not that rule, and it's not any of the helmet to helmet. It's nothing new. That would have been a penalty in 2014. Um, and apparently, I think the defining factor is wrapping them up. Uh, around scoop. the legs, the scoop and lift kind of motion, mm. which is kind of, there's two sides to it, right? It's understandable because that's a motion that tends to lead to dangerous impacts with the ground, because when you scoop, it's like where you're, if you're, your arms are around the quarterback, like kind of in his like upper thigh, kind of like right underneath his butt, and you lift him up, that's going to bring him down very hard on his back and his head. Um, and that's dangerous, but on the other hand, that is a level of precision that is entirely unreasonable to expect from linebackers. So I think it's completely reasonable that Packers fans are mad. At least they called it consistently. They called one on Kendricks as well, um, and Aaron Rodgers himself agrees with me on that, so at least there's that. But I can totally understand why people are mad about this penalty, and I can understand why they called it. Yeah, that's interesting, though. Uh Listening to the radio, a lot of the people calling in were saying the refs were one way or the other, and they they had calls that benefited both sides. I'm not um, sure I'm liking this new terminology of scoop and lift in in the lexicon of the National Football League rules. It's just getting a little funky for me. So anyway, sounds like something that might happen to you in like a back alley of downtown St. Paul. Yeah, or a, at best a, a yearly physical. Um, <laughs> but some of the other news that. Uh, we should touch on. I, I guess I'll go position by position because some of these things overlapped with other things. Um, Tom Johnson got cut uh, by the Seahawks, and now he's back on the team, which uh, means that Perry was released after one game. Um, and a sack on Aaron Rodgers. Yeah, you know, yeah, and I know nice, uh, Vikings tenure. Come in, sack Aaron Rodgers. Yeah, Steve. happy trails, man. And you know they they you know Johnson has been with the team for a long time and he's clearly their guy. Um, I I was in, I was wondering um, and either of you can take this uh, what the impetus for him leaving the Seahawks was. Go ahead, Luke. Yeah, the the Seahawks tried to uh, pull tried to be sneaky. They tried to cut him so that they could promote somebody else from their practice squad that they felt they needed. They ended up I don't believe activating that player. And then uh, this is, there's a lot of like inside sources reporting from the inside the Seahawks that like they intended to pick him back up next week, and the Vikings mm. swooped in and stole him. So it's like poison the pill take five hundred. And yeah, the Seahawks are cratering uh, and a uh, complete abject disaster. And the Vikings. Pick him up <laughs> uh, yet again, it seems like we've had their number for since Steve Hutchinson. We always come out on the better end of the deal. Um, how do you think bringing him back will? Yeah. It's just yeah. depth, but yeah. well, mm-hmm. is he more? I know Perry was more, and they said this during the broadcast. He was known as a run stopper, um, which is yeah. You'll get Jaleel in that role now, and Tom Johnson will play backup three tech, just like okay. he did in 2017. Man, that line is good and it's deep, and I know Luke uh, used the most profanity he's ever used uh, in one sitting or in general, talking about Sheldon Richardson. So we'll, we'll uh, we can uh, save that for. Uh, <laughs> hey, my parents listen to this. 
Yeah. We're young, upstanding <laughs> men. Um, and uh, so Stacy Coley is is in. He's a giant now, I guess. Uh, and uh, they brought in Eldrick Robinson, who has some history around the league, some history with Cousins. I think he Matt Sherman scooped and lifted him right out of here, didn't he? Jesus. Ah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, I think he's, also, he's a deep, he's a speedster, maybe a deep ball guy. Yes. Uh, 4 4 3 40 yard dash, super fast guy. Also, he's 5 10 and a buck 85. So he's just like little, little speedy twerp slot, deep slot guy that will probably fill a Jerry's right esque role, but not be quite as consistent. He's That's wearing really number 17. Mm hmm. And that's kind of what you want from your third receiver, uh, as opposed to a guy who almost single-handedly blew a game for you multiple times. Um, uh, well, yeah, we'll we'll see because he plays most like he he doesn't have the size to play on the outside. So like similarly to Kendall Wright, he like can't really take the snaps away from uh, Laquan Treadwell unless you want to take Thielen out of the slot, which is a bad idea because he eats in the slot like. I mean, look at his gaudy numbers he's had in the last two games. Um, but he will probably just replace whatever snaps T- Stacy Coley was going to have and okay. probably be an upgrade on Coley. Um, and I think Elfline was back for his first full practice today. Um, mm-hmm. Yep, yeah, full participation. Ooh-wee. Things are getting interesting now. Was that... That's good. It'll be interesting to see where they put him. I mean, there's been all this talk that they might they could slide him over to left guard. I don't think they will. I think they'll put Jones over there, but I don't know. It, it remains to be seen. I didn't. I was sick, so I didn't get out to practice today to see to to get a beat on that. But uh... yeah, I was going to see if there was any new indication from stuff from today in regards. So I think Zimmer that a lot of that stemmed from Zimmer's statement that like he'll be he could be back, but maybe not at center. Or it was he said something very Riddle esque. Uh, I don't remember specifically what it was. But it was that's... like he's not guaranteed to start or something like that, but at center it was very strange. I don't know. You'll have some combination of Brett Jones and Pat Elfline, I'm sure. Which do you think would be better? I know, Luke, you follow the offensive line more than, than I do, for sure. Um... I have no earthly idea. Uh, I think it comes down to their run scheme, because Brett Jones is a very bad run blocker. He's been like kind of a catastrophe run blocking. So if it's a matter of if you would rather have that problem at center or if you'd rather have it at left guard, I'd kind of rather have that problem at center. But it also uh, will probably come down to who can get the protection calls in better, which I believe is the center's responsibility on the Vikings offense, and I, I can't ever speak to that. I, I have no idea. Yeah. Uh, but you would have to think that... It, might be an, a net upgrade for the the run game, you know, with all the, uh, yeah. the oh good... sure yeah or something absolutely. Um, like he he will uh, he's going to be you know if he's fully healthy and he can I mean, he's coming off two surgeries one on his ankle or foot and one up, one on his shoulder so if he's good to go and they don't put him out there unless unless he is uh, it, it it's a definite upgrade for this line especially when a line that lost. Rashad Hill and, and had Brian O'Neill step in ad- admirably, I thought, for him last week. So Yeah, a lot of positivity about that, uh, including from independent, uh, non-Vikings-affiliated offensive line people, specifically <laughs> uh, Brandon Thorne, who's an excellent, he's at Veteran Scout on Twitter, he's an excellent Twitter follow, and he does uh, film threads after, after all the games, and he, he pointed out for Brian O'Neill kind of what everybody noticed which was that he he got kind of blown back a couple times and that's part of it is just being undersized part of it was a pad level issue which is something he dealt with in training camp um but the large majority of his sample kind of reflected what we saw from him in the preseason it was very consistent the Packers tried to take advantage of him by uh throwing a whole bunch of stunts and twists which if you don't know what that means it's when the the edge rusher will like crash to the inside instead of where they usually go which is outside and try to lure the right tackle too far in. And then the, the defensive tackle will, like, loop around and try to kind of get to the space that the right tackle vacated. And Brian O'Neill has the agility to, even though he did get lured in a little bit, he had the agility to make it back to his spot and knock the edge rusher off his path and then basically win the rep from there. And, and that, like, the Packers kind of got punished for trying to take advantage of uh, Brian O'Neill, which is excellent 
for the future. Yeah, were you surprised by that? I know um, when you were reporting from training camp, he didn't look ready uh, to really contribute. Uh, oh, yeah. From what I saw in training camp, I thought he was like, wow, if this guy wasn't drafted, he wouldn't make the team. And then he came out in the preseason and he played nicely, and then he came out in this game and he played about as well as he was playing in the preseason. And what, is he just improved on some of those things? Like, you know, the pad level stuff uh, you talked about? It might just be that I'm not a very good in-person scout. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's 50-50. And that's fine. That's a learning experience. <clears throat> and that's part of what what the deal is with him. I mean, for a guy like that who's, who used to be a tight end, the more... The more opportunity he gets to play at this level, at that position, the more he's going to learn. He's a smart guy. Um, like you said, he, he's agile and he's, he's quick. I mean, he's not as big as some of these other guys. So maybe he can make it up with uh, speed as well as, uh, you know, where he doesn't have any strength. I don't know. But I liked, I, I, I've been always kind of hopeful about, about him and, and uh, uh, hoping that it turned around because I, it, part of me s- thinks that, you know, I, they get this line healthy with all these people that are, are supposed to be really good athletes that can move this the different things that this offense can do is spreading you know uh throwing uh, pulling out pulling guards out there and getting these guys on the move I, 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 that's exciting to me so I'm, I'm i'm hoping that it does work well for him and it, that he gets a couple games and, and then maybe you bring back in rashid rashid hill or rashad hill and and uh you got two two players that can play that position so hopefully it uh, works out for him Get that screen game, screen game going again. It was pretty exactly. bad. Yeah, and obviously uh, getting into the Packers game a little bit again. Uh, Cousins had a monster second half, uh, fourth quarter. You know they were driving to score at the end of the third quarter, but didn't really get the points on the board till the fourth. Uh, I forget specifically what his stat line was, but I know that I was over on my uh, over under for for him. You. Oh, so I, I have to tell you this, Joe. So I was with my family, and they listened to our last show, and you jokingly were like 400 yards and four TDs, and they were like, I know. You. And then uh, you were right. I know. <laughs> what is happening? Um, I looked over at my dad and said the same thing. I said, I cannot believe he actually did that. Um, but there you go. I mean, <clears throat> a lot of people are calling it his welcome to Minnesota moment. I think it was Jonathan Kinsley, a brick wall blitz just wrote an article on purpleptsd.com saying that was excellent piece go read it the best performance of cousins is career which is uh highest pff grade of his career there's one other game in 2016 that maybe was better also against the factors look at that um and so yeah i wanted to to get your guys' thoughts on just that um aspect of the offense and of the game just you know it's we'll talk a little bit about the running game <clears throat> two. I um, mean, they they were playing. They he they was, were playing. What was that? I said he was I. <laughs> um, you're so trendy and streetwise. Uh, um, are, are you in a are you in a are you in a gang? Um. So yeah, hey, I. Fourth quarter, Joe. Well, look at it this way. I've been worried about the kicker. I felt validated about that. Treadwell, I was like, hey, who else has been harder on Treadwell than me? And then Cousins, I was like, this is like a Joe Johnson trifecta, which I believe the Bible prophesizes is one of the signs of the apocalypse. So, um, for one of you guys that were poo-pooing Mr. Cousins this offseason, let me have this and explain <laughs> <laughs> explain a little bit, just your thoughts on on what he, what the team did in the passing game. Oh, I uh, yeah. I, I thought he was good. I thought, uh, you know, I thought yeah, I thought he came out a little slow, a little nervous. I thought actually when I was watching him, and he settled down in you know later in the first quarter and started playing a little bit better. And uh, you know, the second half, you know, part of it was the team was the, the the Packers defense was probably worn down a bit, and they had figured him out, and he just lit him up. Oh my goodness, the the balls he was throwing. I mean, it, he he got him deep with the with the. Uh, Pass to Diggs, and which opened it up underneath for people like uh, um, uh, Kyle Rudolph and Treadwell. What? Not Treadwell. Um, <laughs> Theoretically, and, he was open. Care. He had he had his 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 two star receivers just making plays that were great too. But I mean, some of those passes by him were phenomenal. He was standing in there taking shots. You know, he was under duress. That when they've talked about the the, the touchdown pass to to Thielen was 
he was getting hit at his legs at the same time he feathered that in there between those two guys and it's just like you know I hope you saw that one Luke in person you know that might have been one of the one the the feeling touchdown know. where he I did not of... see it in person, but I saw it on TV, and we were like, "Holy crap! Did he catch that?" It was one of the most beautiful touchdowns in Vikings history. I mean, that was an all, all time like Hall of Fame throw. That was insane. It was. Yeah. How do you make that throw? I mean, that takes some cojones to you know. I mean, you get the, yeah. Well, you know, yeah. Kirk Cousins tight. will always force that ball. Like he'll always go for that kind of tight ball, and and this time he had the velocity, the velocity and accuracy to make it, and it's just a thing of beauty. And not yeah, to mention the digs touchdown. Yeah. Oh, what a catch! Um, a catch by feeling. God, yeah. Yeah. yeah holy concentration. Mm-hmm. Um, you- yeah, it was an incredible game. I, I think he did have the same kind of under pressure issues. Uh, that and and I think in the fourth quarter he just turned it on, which is great because like fourth quarter in clutch situations that was supposed to be one of the things that was like super worrisome, and it's super nice to like kind of have that worry be put at ease a little bit. So it's a career game, right? It's literally he's never had a game this good before in his life, so obviously this is not the norm. But like it, it's nice to see some of those things, you know, at, at least quell a little bit, you know, make a good throw under duress, make a good, uh, you know, a big time play. In the, in the clutchest of situations. I, I do I, I can't help but think what the narrative would be if Clay Matthews doesn't doesn't have that roughing the passer call and the game ends on that interception of Alexander. Yeah. I wonder what the narrative is. Good question. Uh that's a, yeah, that's a really good point. I in rewatching the game, um I kinda thought the same thing. But well, was, it, it it you know, like you said, it allowed the Vikings to win. They I, so I cannot be too bad or too mad at this tie of it because you know that was, it was kind of a gift at that time. And so yeah, yeah. yeah. there's there's like nitpicks to have with Cousins' game, especially like there were times when he was under pressure in the first half and he just kind of froze up and took the sack or like you know he scrambled away and ran out of bounds for a yard when and and we could see up you know from our view in the stands we could see guys that were open that he wasn't seeing. Um, yeah, there was yeah, one where was Thielen just, was wide open. He was waving, jumping up and down like dude. Yeah, um, there was the over so, and he threw it to center field and nobody was there within. I mean, yeah, he could. That was definitely like, a miscommunication because he came back and Diggs was like, Diggs, he and Diggs were were talking to each other, so that was somebody did the wrong thing. Yeah, um, yeah, but like communication, obviously. But yeah, 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 yeah. But so, and, and you could nitpick those things. Um, I don't think this is the right time to do it. It is obvious that he like he had a phenomenal game especially in the biggest situation. You know, after that Clay Matthews penalty, he bounced right back up and led this just, like, picture-perfect drive to tie the game, this beautiful fade that Diggs just, like, sunned Tremont Williams on, that there's a clip going around of, of his release on that play, and he just makes Tremont Williams, this, you know, 12-year veteran, look just silly. On the two-point um, conversion? Yeah. That was one and of the most beautiful freaking uh, routes. It was just gross um you know and then he played well in overtime too and and you know he draw he drove the team down in a bunch of situations you know i this is kind of the same thing with the the teddy playoff game right i'm I'm giving the quarterback you have to give the quarterback credit for driving the team down to a situation where they have a very good chance to win the game and then the kicker screws it up yeah and we all we wish we all given a second lease on life like he was given there to take that kind of advantage of it. How about that? I mean, he's laying on his back, exactly. throws an interception, he gets up and puts that drive together, something else. And something else. what are your guys' thoughts on sustainability? Like, obviously we don't want Cousins to be in the position to need to throw the ball that much. Um, and he, I think he had like 72 oh, points. I mean, yeah, but it wouldn't it be great if he didn't have to and, like, they were moving the chains like crazy? Um, in a perfect right. world, uh, speaking of arrogance, I guess. But uh, I think he had like 73% completions, which is like 8% over his career average. Uh, but it didn't seem like outside of a couple deep balls that those were – any part of that was unsustainable. There's a lot of, you know, over-the-middle stuff, a lot of the Rudolph stuff you talked about. I think he got the ball to seven different guys. Um, it seems like, you know, just he's executing this scheme, and it, it's working. So I think I don't, in the future he might – he, he might might not go to Treadwell as often. That might <laughs> let's, hope, let's, let's hope not. Yeah. Uh, so here's the thing that's, like, so exciting. It's terrifying. Um, 
the the offensive line gave him about the same pressure pressure percentage as he got in week one. He's been in largely clean pockets, and we know he can slice and dice from there. And the offensive line has been able to execute that pretty cleanly two weeks in a row. If that keeps up, that's when we're going to see you know career numbers out of Kirk Cousins if he can be under you know that kind of uh, if he can be kept that clean. Yeah. And uh, Joe, you mentioned Treadwell. Um, I know they they asked Cousins after the game why that he kept going back to him, and he said just kind of what I said. It was a scheme thing, and if I go through my progressions and one and two are in Diggs and Thielen are covered, I'm going to go to the third guy if he's open, and that third guy is Treadwell. Uh, do you – I guess the best way to put this out there uh, now that it's Wednesday night, do you foresee Treadwell getting – Against the Bills, for example, those opportunities again, or in bringing in a guy who doesn't have the same body type or really even uh, skills as Treadwell, is that a sign that they might be moving towards someone that Cousins has familiarity with so they can plug him in a little bit quicker? Or is, is Zilstra the, the winner of this? I can't divulge that or else I'd give away my prediction for the prediction segment. But uh, um, <laughs> what, I hope it's that Treadwell scores like eight touchdowns. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, Luke, you're making me mad with that with that line you set there. But anyway, um, I, I really think that they'll start uh, – they're going to look at some of these other guys. I, I think Zilter could be active for this game. And I'm not going to say they're going to they're going to set down Treadwell, but – um, they got to start looking at other players, especially since they lost Coley, you know. So they're going to have to bring up uh, one of those guys and, and give them a look. Why not? This guy's caught passes out of profession as a professional for years. So let him see what he can do, especially in a game against the Bills. There's a little less pressure this week. Um, why not? You know, that's what I that's what yeah. I like. I I, I don't want to see another, you know, uh, an afternoon of watching and hoping that Treadwell catches the damn ball. My goodness. Yeah, uh, there's a rumor that Zilstra is having a similar problem to Treadwell in that he's, like, not able to, like, make the right reads and run the right routes. Serious. Which is maybe what? which is maybe why he hasn't overtaken Treadwell yet, because he's having that problem more severely than, than Treadwell is at this point. Um, I don't think I, I don't think this is up to Kirk Cousins, right? Like, he doesn't look at the number on the guy's jersey before no. he decides whether or not to throw it. If it's open, he's going to throw it. Yeah. But... Uh, but but I think you might you'll probably see Treadwell's snap count de- decline and maybe exactly. we'll see like Zilstra get in there for a couple of them. Maybe you'll see more like double slot shenanigans with Aldrich Robinson, um, or you know maybe you will see Thielen swing out as the outside receiver a little more often or or have weird stuff. They had weird stuff like uh, Dalvin Cook lining up out wide and he actually got a really nice uh, completion out of that. So you might see maybe more stuff like that. than I think if if Robinson has, is up to speed, they'll have him on the. Up, you know, he'll he'll be running some plays and taking some of some of uh, yeah. Treadwell snaps. Yeah, absolutely. And he'll probably be active just to play on the kickoff team, right? And replace Stacy Co- and punt teams and replace Stacy Coley there. Um, and sure, they only have you know five wide receivers. All five were active, I think, in both weeks. Except I think Silstrom might have been still inactive if he was hurt or something. But they'll they'll probably active all the receivers again. Have them all go on special teams, and we'll see what kind of snap count Treadwell gets. And me and Joe talked about this on Morning Joe's, but I think Treadwell had six targets on Sunday, so there's a decent amount of eyeballs for him. Yeah, uh, he dropped, in yeah. General. and his touchdown was so nice, and it looked really, really great, and then he just cratered. Yeah, I wonder, you know, he looked so despondent over that first drop for that when he tried to turn before pulling the ball in, and he just missed it for that, uh, it was like a third and five. I don't know if he just got caught in his own head or what, but man, uh, he was he was going across the middle and looking for the next hit. He turned too quickly. Mm-hmm. He even put it away. Yeah, it was... and that's that all of his drops have been him not looking it in, which is a super super basic thing. Yep. Did he you do know, that in college like a lot? Was he just unacceptable? Was and he just like had... Deion Sanders seeing the ball all the time or what? It's just that... yeah, it's it's a it's a nerves and a confidence thing. It's it's a mental kind of thing. And most of the problems that have kept him off the field and like soured his tenure here have all been mental. It's never really been that much of an ability thing. And and it's, you know at this point, it's like very clear that this is not going to get better. <clears throat> you can't cut him because yeah. of cap reasons because he's a first round pick, and so he's just going to eat up a roster spot for a couple years and leave. And that'll have to be that. 
Wow, that's really too bad. We, you know, we Kirk talked Cousins this off. Did, you know, Kirk Cousins did hit him in the, in the hands with that one, so that's kind of on Kirk. You know, that when it was <laughs> should have known better. Yeah. Yeah, me and Joe talked about this too. I, I was uh, now that you brought that up because Coley missed out too. Uh, it went through his hands when they they yeah. replaced him, and I was wondering if uh, Cousins just had this like laser cannon of an arm that maybe these guys just aren't used to or something. <laughs> Um, but it is the NFL, so you think they would be. Um, before we move on to the Bills game, we should probably touch on the defense a little bit too. Um, Luke, you brought up – I know after the 49ers game, we talked about the day that – I think it was Hunter and Richardson had combined and the pressures they got. And it was like, well, they, Rich, you know, Richardson can't really sustain that many like hurries or pressures. And it sounds like for the, the most part he did – uh, the guy's an yeah. animal. He's quickly becoming my favorite line. guy on the team. Yeah, it, it was a big storyline in Green Bay media leading up to the game. Uh, they have a backup guard in right now, Justin McCrary, or a kind of malign guard. I don't actually know if he's the backup or not. Um, and they're like, is Justin McCrary going to be able to handle Sh- Sheldon Richardson? Turns out, no. Uh, he had the one <laughs> sack, which is beautiful and, and, and is a huge highlight. Hit Aaron Rodgers three times and got two other hurries. That's six pressures from a defensive tackle, which is another gaudy game. Um, but Daniel Hunter only had two pressures. Uh, Everson Griffin got three again, even though I think he might have been playing hurt. Um, but other, overall, you know, the pressure game is still looking really great. And I'm sure that, you know, even like Daniel Hunter, he's not going to have eight pressures every game. He'll have some of these two first. And that's still nice. Yeah, Joe, you mentioned too on, on Morning Joe's, not to keep plugging that show, but I think one of your Tuesday ta- Tuesday's tales of the tape was that the defense had – a better day than the, than the numbers showed. Uh, if you could kind of elaborate on that a little bit. Oh, well, I had those written down. I don't have them with me now. But, yeah, I just thought, you know, they were – they held uh, the Packers to 4 of 17 on third downs, I think is what they performed. Yeah, and, like, the points weren't the same because of the block punt touchdown. Right. Um, well, they only gave up one touchdown. They they gave up a lot of field goals. They were, I guess they held them to only one one out of five in the red zone, you know. So they, they actually played pretty well. Uh, overall, it's just uh, um, they had their mistakes. You know, they got, they, as Zimmer said quite vociferously, they let uh, Jimmy Graham lose a couple times. But I, And there was a number of missed tackles. You know, I, I heard somewhere it was like 13 missed tackles in the game, which is a high number. So I thought there was a lot of that going on. a huge on. number. But actually in, look it up. in general, uh, I, I you know, oh. pardon me? Eight. Yeah. Eight missed tackles. Yeah, three from Mackenzie Alexander, two from Waynes, and a handful of people with one. Right. So it it's uh, it, it you know in in the scheme of things, I mean, it's still they're still playing against a, uh, an Aaron Rodgers that was you know he couldn't move as good as he usually does, but he was still effective and he still you know uh, played well. So I, I I'm not I can't get down on him too much for giving up 29 points, especially when they've got a, a field goal kicker that's kicking them all over the park and. Um, showing our field goal kicker what you're supposed to do. So no, I I, I I'm not down on the defense yet, and uh, also although there are a lot of people that are worried about him, I, you know they're going to bounce back this week for sure. Segway. They had some gap discipline issues that led to some runs that were probably too big, and that's why the the Packers were. I think they had like four different drives that were ten plus plays, and it was hot and humid out. Um, yeah, and that, it was I think also kind of leads that that you know will will lead to problems later. You had some cramping late in the game, um, but that you know you you can't let up ten play drives over and over and over in the game. And there were some definitely some run defense issues that led to that, and definitely some issues. Uh, Mackenzie Alexander had some problems. He was getting very aggressive, and uh, they were getting caught on that. Uh, Xavier Rhodes tried to get aggressive a couple times, and, and kind of got punished for that. Um, I, I think, on the whole, the defense should probably start adjusting to be a little bit more conservative and a little bit less, you know, greedy and trying to, like, jump routes for interceptions. Um, because I think the worst plays that have happened have been, you know, players either misreading the play, which you can't do much about, right? You just made a mistake. Or, you know, trying to, to jump a route and then getting got when you realize you've, you've been on a fake. Yeah, we talked about that last week with uh, Harrison Smith doing that against the 49ers on that touchdown, I believe. Um, but, but then he, that's yeah. probably what their emphasis is in the, coming into this season was to get more uh, more uh, turnovers. So maybe they got to dial that back a little bit if it doesn't I work. I think they should. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, 
And Joe, you did lob up a really great segue to the Bills game. Um, you wrote the preview article for the game this week, which you do every week. So I thought I would uh, lob it right back and see what your th- the initial thoughts were on the trap well, game. I, not yeah, I, called the I trap hate game. To use that term, that term, the trap game, but that's essential because <laughs> I, I think I think with a seven, you know, the line for this game started at sixteen point five. It's gone up to seventeen, so nobody's betting on the Bills and. Yeah, that's a that's a crazy line. It is, and you know, if if you get trapped by this, um, okay, I, I I'm I'm done on the podcast. So they they should not lose this <laughs> game. They uh, they they have everything going in their favor. They got a, a quarterback that's uh, will be starting a second game, and you know he can move. He can get out of the pocket. He likes to throw on the run, so he's. He's going to be active and they'll have to watch him. They'll probably get the, the legs of Aaron Rodgers that they didn't see last week, but uh, certainly not the the experience and the brain of an Aaron Rodgers or maybe even the arm. But uh, they've got a lot of turmoil going on. They're, they're, uh, their coach just took over play calling for uh, on the defensive side for Leslie Frazier, which is a bummer. They had uh, they had a, a, a cornerback retire at halftime of the game, which is just a, a, <laughs> an amazing thing. And, and LaShawn McCoy, who, who, who hurt his ribs last week, and now he's got some paternity suit or some kind, no, I'm not, some kind of uh, lawsuit with the fa- mother of his uh, child or something going on. So they are a team in disarray. And, and if they come in here and somehow the Vikings overlook them and uh, are not ready to go, that, oh, my goodness. I don't know what to say to that. So I, I think they're going to actually, you know, play quite well against them and and uh, get themselves get their ship right in back in the winning direction. Get right game. Yeah. There you go. Uh, yeah, it it should be a get right game. Um, the biggest weakness uh, for the Bills, among many, is their passing game, which is probably the worst thing to have be a weakness. It's like kind of the most important one. Uh, but Josh Allen. JR has tweeted about this a lot, Jay Reed, uh, NFL on Twitter, um, that Josh Allen just holds the ball way too long. He does not process very quickly. This was the in college. We, we talked about it all going leading up to the draft and, and scouting him at Wyoming. He just doesn't process the field quickly enough. So he will stand back there, and then he'll scramble around and try to make something happen. And he'll turn into a scramble drill, which is not, you know, he's not Aaron Rodgers on those, um, and then end up taking a sack or whatever. Uh, he is credited with as many pressures himself <laughs> per PFF as four of his linemen. Nice. And, and his line actually has a reasonable pass blocking grade. So it's not that, you know, his line is like letting him down. It's that he just can't <clears throat> survey the field and they don't really have the, the receiving weapon firepower to, you know, to like digs and feel in their way through this. They have a, just a very bad offense. The defense should feast. But I think. The only way to lose this is, you know, if they get faked out on things and get really greedy and, you know, have all these unforced errors like a really bad uh, hitting a defenseless player call like the one Sandejo had or, you know, pass interferences or, or, um, you know, stupid illegal contact moments or hands to the face moments. Um, That's the only way you're going to lose this. You just have to play a nice, clean Vikings football game and, and you'll get ahead easily. How did they make the playoffs last year? Like, is was it all Tyrod Taylor? Tyrod Taylor. And so why? Yeah, Tyrod uh, Taylor propelled them a lot, um, and Lashawn McCoy propelled them a lot. Uh, but right now they're they're really just they've just cratered. It's such a disaster those first two weeks for them. This this could be the kind of like this could be a game that gets their coach fired if it's bad enough, considering just the media attitude in Buffalo. Um, which would be a crazy thing to get you know your coach fired in September, but it's happened before. Yeah, they've got an offense that's thirty first, I think, in points, tied for thirty first with uh, with well, no, I should say offense for it's thirty first in yards and points, and a defense that's tied for thirty first with the uh, I cannot I can't somewhere along it's in, the, it's in my my story, but it, they they are at the bottom of the league in so many categories, so it's uh, yeah it'd be we 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 could lustfully boo them off the field if they lose on Sunday, which yeah, I don't normally do. I'm pretty I sure they just can't imagine that happening. Mm-hmm. It, it would be so incredible if that happened. Yes. They're favored by 16 and a half. Yeah. Seven, I, 17 this morning. Jesus. I wrote the, the line piece yesterday 
and I have been doing those since 2015, and I can't remember a bigger line for the Viking. Since I, I then. Either. It's just a buzzsaw for them, and it's super sad for Bills fans who, you know, kind of hoped that they would get something better, hoped that they were in their, like, right future, you know, new rookie, exciting quarterback, he's this crazy athlete, and he's just a catastrophe. Yeah, that's why you don't take stuff for granted, I guess, you know. I didn't feel like they ever really uh, appreciated what Taylor did there. Can't wait yeah. to talk about this game on Friday morning, Joe. There's so much there. <coughs> so we also have um, uh, Lorenzo Alexander is probably the best defender. Uh, he plays linebacker, Sam linebacker, and he is uh, day to day for the game. And if he doesn't play, then the offense should be able to just feast. Otherwise, he might be the kind of guy you know lurking in those underneath routes or affecting the run game. Um, and but you know they've got they they lost Devonte Davis for retiring in the middle of the game. They have uh, I believe it's EJ Gaines and Tre'Davious White who was the exciting rookie last year. Tre'Davious White is, should be pretty good. Uh, EJ Gaines is okay, um, but otherwise we just outclassed them just everywhere on the field. It'll be a good game. You know they got the Rams coming up after that, so they got to really put their best uh, performance out there. Uh, we have a couple. Get up early and see a lot of their uh, uh, backups in there, and they can rest up for the, the Thursday game the following week. Well, let's hope. Uh, we have a couple minutes left. Let's get into the predictions from last week and this week. I do believe I, uh, as I mentioned earlier, was right on my over-under, which was just really awesome. Yes. Here's the thing. Not only did the Vikings and Packers tie, but so did you two. Weird. Really? For, yep, you both missed by 14 points exactly, so no, uh, That's no blood. round gained. That's actually, uh, I thought for sure I got smoked um, in that regard. So I'm still down by 10 points, I think, is the number for scores. Oh, that, uh, this is going to yes. sound cocky, but isn't that kind of like a win for you? In this? <laughs> you know what's sad? is It, it, it is it, neither it, a win, nor is it a loss. It's But for me, yes, it very much is a moral victory. Um, <laughs> yikes. Uh, I was kidding. I saw. You want me to read off the over unders? Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. All right. So if you remember, we had uh, Kirk Cousins. Uh, he hit the over. Adam Thielen. He hit the over. And Aaron Rodgers did not turn the ball over. So I lost along with a handful of our uh, loving, loving listeners. Um, but so Kirk Cousins as Joe Johnson. Also uh, Skull Murgiesa. Oh, sorry, I'm never going to pronounce that. Lodi Malone, Brian Moret, and I keep it so real. Uh, Overly, you were on the Thielen over, which he crushed. Uh, Brandon Ashwood, Steve says, three MTA three, and Odin in Valhalla. Wow, uh, all were correct there. Um, Good response. They all. I uh, know. I, I just decided because it was a tie, and the, the Vikings neither win nor lost, that I would just exclude the Vikings win segment of it for this one. But it's still part of it going forward. Uh, and I have got the uh, the raffle going on right now. Ooh, the um, ran- the randomizer, the internet randomizer. Yes, and it will go to I keep it so real at I keep ah. it so real. If you're listening, please uh, DM at Purple PTSD on Twitter. And that was a that, that was a bullet dodge. You can pronounce that one right, Luke. Yeah. <laughs> it is. It's that is really really cool though that that many people <laughs> listen to the show and yeah, participate in yeah. that. That puts and a big had, uh, smile on my five- face. Five other listeners that took the Aaron Rodgers over and were wrong about it. And they were so close to being right. As were you. Yeah. You know, right, they, that read option fumble. I was thinking about it. <clears throat> um, uh, so this week so I think guys, we have some different ones um, that are all pretty juicy. Yeah, uh, you want to do that first? Wait, wait, Joe should do his prediction on the game. Score yeah, you also do that first. Ooh, that's a rough one. Um, there's a few variables there. I it, I agree with you guys that it, you know it would take some sort of high level catastrophe for this thing to even be close. Um, but I wrote this in my over under the odds piece yesterday. I don't think that I would take the Vikings winning, but the under on the score. I uh, just I don't necessarily think the things that they're going to be working on are conducive with them scoring a million points. They might want to run the ball a little bit more, get that working, maybe uh, kick some field goals when they might not otherwise uh, just to see what Bailey is doing if the, if the score is comfortable so I think it's going to be a Vikings win I, I, I will go a little bit higher than I did in my article 
and say 24 10 Vikings. Wow. I like that. They, they might be ahead three scores in in the third quarter and then just like let off the gas. And That's yeah. my Vikings. biggest concern because I've got them at 31 9. So I, I need some points out of them. Ooh. And uh, that is that is a an uncharacteristically aggressive prediction from you. It is. It is. I generally don't, but you know, I, I just don't want to keep pounding on my other Joe there. So ah, uh, much appreciated. I I All need right. it. I'm gonna do this fast. I know we're up against the clock here. Uh, so the. Game works like this. Tell me which of these over unders you want to pick, and your pick on it. So it can. I have three over under here, under over unders here. You can pick over or under any single one of them. Don't pick all three. So that'll be basically there's six different options that you can choose from, and then uh, tell me who you think is going to win the game. This one's pretty. Your first, Luke, because you uh, lost. No, I got it wrong. So here are the options. Uh, I have Daniil Hunter. The over under is three and a half tackles and one and a half sacks. Uh, Laquan Treadwell I put in here I thought this was hilarious two and a half targets he doesn't need to catch him boys he just needs to get him is he going to play you tell me two and a half targets Uh, and Kyle Rudolph also four and a half catches for 50 and a half yards Um, I am going to take the Daniil Hunter over I think even though tackles is hard because he's an edge rusher and and sometimes that doesn't lead to like run tackles Um, I think he's going to feast on the sacks and and uh, I think the the Bills just entire game, especially with a banged up LeSean McCoy, I think uh, this is going to be the game camper. So I'm taking a win, and I'm taking a Daniel Hunter over. Well, I'm I get to go second because Joe's two and zero. Oh. So I, I I struggle with this because I've been oh, wanting to go after that under on Treadwell. I've been staring at it all day, but I just think you're not going <laughs> to get. You're not going to give up on them yet. I, I commend you again, Luke, on how good these lines that you're setting are because they're just each Thank one's you, different. Fire. They're they're uh, they're they're difficult. They're 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 very good. So I'm going to go with Rudy, and I'm going to go with the over. All right. I think, I think uh, somebody hit the balls that uh, should go to Treadwell. Gonna, he's going to start looking Rudy's way more often. So uh, I'll take the under on Treadwell then, and a win. I. Uh... I have to imagine that they can't make that same mistake. And the only reason I would think they would have him out there is to, to give him like a chance to try, but they've done that so many times. They know what they got in the guy. I think, Luke, you said that earlier. You know, they just At this point, it's supposed to be his breakout season, and it's just not happening. So, uh, was two and a half, was it? Two and a half targets. So if he gets yeah. thrown at three times, he hits the over. How no, long yeah. if he steals one of them that was intended for Rudy? Th- that's a that? very that's a very good question. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna go with how PFF charts that. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. I could see that happening. Um, but yeah, I want to uh, let have everyone listen to Morning Joe's is every Tuesday and Friday at nine thirty in the morning. So we will be back at nine thirty this morning. Uh, we might be a little early next Tuesday, but we'll keep you posted. Um, but other than that. Follow us on social media at PurplePTSD, at Vikings Territory. Follow our sponsors, Pearl Football Focus and Revitalite. Um, And check out our live chat on Sunday, which we will have up and running around 11 o'clock Sunday morning. Uh, But thanks for listening. Thanks for participating in the over-unders game. It's been really cool. Uh, We will be back next Wednesday night around 8.30, 8.45 with a new show. Thanks for listening. And skull. Yep, I got it. I got aggressive.